one. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, it is my honor to be able to introduce the speaker. Um, Dr. Um, Billy Wason holds a PhD from the University of Virginia and studied economics at George Washington University and at the University of Iowa, earned a Bachelor of Arts in phil phil Philosophy. Um, his research interests are cultural, social, economic, and political history from mid-18th century to the late antebellum period, with specific curiosity for the subjects of family, gender, household, and community. Dr. Wason is deeply engaged in long-term projects to examine Thomas Jefferson's financial affairs in the context of political, social, and cultural forces affecting the economic activities and agricultural technology at the turn of the century. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to, my pleasure is to introduce Dr. Billy Wason. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jen. I wasn't sure who she was introducing there for a moment. <laughs> Sounded like kind of an academic uh, resume. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's great to be in Arlington. This is part of my old stomping grounds when I used to uh, live up here and be a fed and uh, also had a research firm down in Alexandria. So it's good to be back. I don't recognize the place anymore. It's doubly good to be here because usually, you know, Jefferson isn't, sometimes isn't welcome up here in this country too well. In the world of Fairfaxes and Washingtons and Custises and stuff like that. So it's particularly nice. I was down in the Alexandria today with the DAR, and they were even very gracious to, to have me come up. So maybe some of that enmity that was created back in the last a couple centuries ago has gone away. Uh, I really, really appreciate being here. Uh, I wanted to uh, begin, uh, begin this really not by talking about Martha, but by talking about some other folks in this area, uh, the Custis family. We have, of course, uh, uh, George Washington Park Custis here, the Lee Custis Mansion, a uh, famous person from this area. Uh, less well known are his sisters. Um, uh, I really like, uh, th this is Nellie Custis, sometimes called George Washington's beautiful Nellie. But my favorite is Eliza Custis, because she had such a, such a wonderful uh, history. And these are contemporaries of Martha Jefferson Randolph, is the reason I bring them in here today. And they're from this area. And it's around the issue, particularly with Eliza Custis, of women's education. And one of the ways I got interested in Martha was beginning to look at Jefferson and gendered education. And Eliza came into that, came into that uh, picture. I just have one little, one of her uh, near relatives across the river talked about Eliza this way. She said, and her, she married Thomas Law. Thomas Law was a land speculator here. Uh, in this Washington area. She said, when Mrs. Law entered society, she was very pretty, rich, and intelligent. She was always very vain about her mind and her knowledge. In her tastes and pastimes, she was more a man than a woman and regrets that she can't wear the pants. <laughs> so that was women's attitude about women's education. Tonight I want to really talk about a very special father-daughter relationship, the relationship between Martha Jefferson and her father. I'd also like to talk some about how that relationship developed. What, there was a cataclysmic event in both their lives that caused them to bond together so that she became, I argue in the book, what made his political career possible. So she's the reason for the title tonight, The Lost Daughter of the American Revolution. And there was a whole generation of lost daughters, intelligent women uh, who were kind of kept in the background intentionally. Uh, or socially and culturally, but they were very intelligent, and some of them, like Eliza Custis, really felt that. She was permitted to study with her brother until he got to the level of studying Latin, and then her stepfather said, that's inappropriate for a girl, it'll make you too manly to learn Latin. So this question, this tension during the time when Martha grew up, this tension about women and their role, forget about voting, just their status in society and that culture. The third thing I would hope we could do is help us remind, help remind us how hard that struggle was and how long it took and how difficult for what it must have been for these women. Uh, Martha Jefferson was lucky. She had an enlightened father and through some circumstance of, hit of time, she, they became very close. So she had a much fuller really life. Some of these other women did not. So those are kind of the three things I'd like to do tonight. The book begins, really, uh, there's a little background that we'll go through uh, in 1782. 
But Martha, she was born in 1772. Just make that as a marker in your mind if you can hold it. Think about 1772. We didn't know we were going to have a revolution yet, but there was sure a lot of social disorganization and political frenzy on a lot of different issues. And that's when she was born in 1772. By 74, her father was already known internationally, not for a declaration, but for some other work they had done that by mistake got published into Europe. So he was known as a fine draftsman. And soon he was actively involved in this run up to the revolution. And she was drugged from pillar to post along with him and her mother and other siblings, that, uh, uh, most of whom did not survive. So this is a tumultuous period for this child. Um, and so we see her. And also a thing I'm, I want to re, uh, just recall is Charlottesville was the boondocks. Albemarle County was the frontier. We kind of think of it today. Well, it was when I moved there 30 years ago, too. But uh, <laughs> and that, that's changed. But my point around that is, is that so here she's in this kind of isolated environment, running back and forth from that into Williamsburg, which was the center of life and culture at the time. At the same time, her father is gone for extended periods of time, and her mother is pregnant every 10 months. And the children are dying with about the same frequency. So just, I just have this picture to kind of remind us of that, of her life trajectory moving from this kind of primitive background. It wasn't that magnificent mansion you have today. It was pretty a shambles. Down into this wonderful Williamsburg. Uh, they lived in part time in, in, George, in the George With house, which you can still see today, and other times in a two room apartment. And then coming back, Philadelphia, Europe, and then back to the plantation as a plantation mistress. So age 10. These are the kind of things that she's going through. And to point that up, we have the British invasion. Not this one. This was the first British invasion. Uh, for some music lovers, it was about as traumatic as the other British invasion when the Beatles came. But that uh, we have in 1781 Arnold occupying part of Richmond. Uh, the governor, Jefferson, and his family have to flee in the dead of winter out of Richmond to the west, um, and in the course of that, Martha's baby sister gets sick and dies in that springtime. By the summertime, the British are back. Tarleton is, takes out for Rit Charlottesville to try to capture Jefferson and the cabinet, and again, the family has to flee. She's now born in 1772, 1781, nine years old, and she, that, th this is her early life. Think about that, how it imprints on a child. Now, that's important because within just a short period of time, we have the cataclysmic event that really, really bonded them together. The book uh, has several themes. It was based on about 900 letters uh, between Martha, her father, her husband, and, and the grandchildren. Uh, it focuses on this period, 1782 to, 17, to 1809. I'll make explain that why, with some material, only two chapters on this later period. Um, the core story of the book is about affection. Now, this is a site of Jefferson we don't usually think about, and I'll explain that too in a moment, but affection is like the theme of the book, and it's what really holds them together, and it's a way that they look at family, too, as a family bound together by affection, more so than can consanguinity, more so than blood. So when you talk about the Jefferson family, that could include people that aren't related in blood by blood at all, who are living there. Eliza House Tris from Philadelphia lived there in her old, in her old age. Uh, and we had other people like that. They would take them in, anyone that they felt attached to. Public service is a key part of this story. And then because if you feel close to someone, you've probably done this. If you had a daughter or son that you sent off to college and they were gone, or you had someone in the service. I just talked to someone today. She said, I, my, uh, my significant person is not, got on their second deployment and we write every week. Letters, not emails. Not emails. So she had said, when you said this, I understood exactly what you meant. So separation, they were torn apart. They had to feel close, torn apart. And so to do that, they created this imaginary family in their letters. Now, I know that your family, all the stories about your family are true, can be documented 100%, right? 
Yeah, well, we all have family stories. And they, because they were separated, they would talk about, how's it going to be? What was it like? I remember when we were there. What do you think will happen when? So there's this kind of dialogue going on in these letters and have an imaginary family, and you would hope that some of us could live up to the ideal that they put forward. Place becomes important. It's important. Place is important in the South because that's the seat of your family. Monticello becomes, their affection becomes attached there, and debt, of course. We can't talk about Jefferson without talking about that. Now, a side of Jefferson we usually don't know was he was a sentimentalist. Now, not in the way we use that term today. When we, when we talk about someone being sentimental, we kind of, it's kind of critical, and we think, oh, they're looking to the past, they're not realistic. At this period of time, from roughly 1750 up until about 1815, until Jane Austen killed sentimentality, <laughs> uh, there, uh, Lawrence Stern was kind of the creator of this whole literary movement. Jefferson's favorite author was Lawrence Stern, and wrote the sentimental novel, and this is what they meant by sentimental. They meant someone who had, a fe had feeling, excuse me for getting in your way all the time, excuse me. Um, they were sensitive, they were generous, and that was considered a very manly trait. It originally was gendered female, but in this period of time, for 75 some years, being a senate was a real mark of honor. Jefferson was a sentimentalist. A woman who knew him very well, uh, uh, the wife of a, uh, one of the first newspaper people in Washington City, uh, Margaret Bayard Smith had this to say about Jefferson. She said, uh, if his life had not proven to the contrary, I should have pronounced him rather a man of imagination and taste than a man of judgment, a literary rather than a scientific man, and least of all a politician, a character for which nature never seemed to have intended him. So we see her seeing Jefferson in a different way when he allowed himself to take down the facade. Well, Here's what he said about himself. He said, the whole of my life has been at war with my natural taste, feelings, and wishes. Domestic life and literary pursuits were my first and my latest inclinations. Circumstances, not my desires, led me to the path I have lived. So here's a person who spent 60 years in public life, 60 years, and many of them in emotional torment which we'll cover in a minute. Many of those in emotional torment. It was Martha that fulfilled this literary side of Jefferson, the emotive side, the imaginary side that Margaret Bayard Smith talked about. She was his emotional bulwark for him in the midst of political fray. He was not a very good down in the trenches politician. For that you go to Hamilton or James Madison, but not Thomas Jefferson, even though he did invent political parties. Damn him forever. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he really created the first organized political party with the Jeffersonian Republicans. But he was not a down-in-the-trenches guy because he was constantly, he didn't like what it involved. That's just Margaret Bayard, that's just uh, Margaret Bayard Smith. So 1782 to 1835. 1782, Martha's mother died as a result of the complications of childbirth. Six children, ten years. Okay? Of those children, only two lived to adulthood. Uh, three were already deceased at the time of her sixth child. Okay, and that child would die at about age two and a half after she had passed. So think about ten-year-old child, pillar to post over the first ten years. Her uh, her her father gone a long long periods of time, and this is what happened. She died. The violence of his emotion, when almost by stealth I entered his room by night, to this day I dare not describe to myself. You can read as well as I can. So we see, look at the time frame here we're talking about. We're talking, I'm not very good at math, I'm a historian. Uh, someone else will have to do the numbers, but probably 52 years, roughly. This is, this is how much that imprinted her. He was in his room for three weeks, and they, some thought that he was going to die from grief. He literally passed out. When he got the word that his wife had died, he passed out. So 52 years later, she's saying, I remember that, that moment. This is said in the context of traveling some of the same paths that they took just a few weeks after her mother died. Because Jefferson's approach to dealing with grief was to get the hell out. <laughs> he left Virginia on his way to Paris as a, to be a peace commissioner, 
didn't make it that time, but because they, they reached an agreement on peace in Paris in 1783. So they came back. They left the other children at home, the two other two surviving children, and she went off with him to Philadelphia. They came home and left again soon in 1784. Uh, to begin uh, their trek, their wanderings over the world, as he called it. So the first, uh, and this is what I want to read from the book. So they went to Philadelphia, and uh, in 1784, their second trip, they left, she, he left her in a boarding house and went to Annapolis. It's because the Congress were a little bit afraid of the veterans who were demonstrating because they hadn't been paid. I don't know. We, after World War I, we had that kind of thing. It's just an American thing. You know, we don't pay the vets, so they get upset. I don't know why that is. Seems like just being ungrateful. So they went to Annapolis. She's left there by, in a boarding house. She ultimately gets put into another, in, in, into a, uh, a more of a family setting, but still the woman there is running a boarding house. I mean, she's running a, a place where people stay. So that's kind of, and she's very upset about that. I don't know why, but she is. But this is Jefferson never to be idle. This is what he, he, he said. He said, the plan, uh, he, this is writing to someone else. He says, I'm uh, I, the plan of reading which I have formed for her is considerably different for what I would think to be most proper for her sex in any place other than America. What is he talking about? Her so he's gendered the reading lists. He's also placed it in America. So this is a very unique reading list, I guess. I'm obliged to extend my views beyond herself and consider her as possible head of a little family of her own. Huh. The chance that in marriage she'll mer draw a blockhead, I calculate to be about 14 to 1. <laughs> this is usually where I stop and ask, are there any Randolph relatives in the audience? Because <laughs> that'll affect what I say for the rest of the evening. If there isn't, I'll tell some Randolph stories. Um, I calculate 14 to 1. Her family will probably rest on her own ideas and direction without assistance. He's perceiving a role for this. She's 12 by this point, almost 12. A role for this young girl that is not what the gender roles were for the day. It's different. And particularly in the plantation south. This was not where you'd be where the patriarchal society heavily patriarchal, and she was going to be head of a little family, probably responsible for education of her children by herself without assistance. It's pretty radical. Much here later, uh, they had the opportunity to elaborate on this reading list. It had never been found. Uh, I was sitting one lonely night in a library going through microfilm, and I happened to find it at the end of a microfilm reel. It's every historian's dream, you know, the document that hasn't been published, blah, blah, blah. I found it and uh, went out and had a drink to celebrate. <laughs> Not wine, whiskey. <laughs> this was too big a thing to leave the wine. It wasn't, it wasn't enough celebration. Uh, but lo many years later, after she'd had her 12th child, four days after she'd had her 12th child, he asked her to come help make a list of the reading books that she'd read when he was this, reading, this plan of reading. Now, whether she read them all, I don't know, uh, but they included they were, they were not quite male and they were not quite female for the times. They were kind of halfway in between, but very advanced, okay? Very advanced. So he asked her to come help him with that. And you'll see here how he's now expanded this notion of, a, of the woman in a household. Um, her husband not only may be a blockhead, he may be incapable, inattentive, and unavailable. Well, that happened. Now, he's had a lot of experience with his son-in-law by this point. And he's been in, uh, unavailable many times. He was not incapable, except when he was having one of his mental uh, states. Um, but here's the other thing that he's elevated pretty highly, and that is honorable. The household is honorable. How you run the household. Very unusual to think about that. Uh, a plantation household was not just a home. It was a social place. It was a political place. It's where you did politics a lot of the time. And you, and, Everyone talks about the mansion. Well, the mansion was kind of political overhead that you had to have if you wanted to be successful in that culture as a politician. You had to have a nice home, a magnificent home. That was part of your cachet. Some of these mansions we have in Arlington, that's an, you know, those people, I don't know, they're probably not in politics, they're in IT or something. But here's what I think is important here is 
this notion that he's elevated the household now. He's, de he's further degraded the husband and elevated management of the household as something that is really honorable. And we all know what that means in the South, you know, being uh, matters of honor are very important. So uh, Jefferson was appointed, uh, he did, was not appointed peace commissioner, but he was appointed to replace Franklin as minister plenipotentiary. When I was in government, I wanted that title so bad, not GS14 or GSX or a management blah, blah, blah. I wanted to be like a plenipotentiary. I never made it, never got that high, but I thought that was a wonderful title. I wish we had more of them like that today. So that they were, <coughs> well, in Philadelphia, now we begin to see, we begin to see the screw tightening. If you love me, then you, you'll do this plan of reading and the things I've, uh, the things I've laid out for you, if you love me, okay? And it'll make you more worthy of my love, and if you don't make the acquirements, at least it won't make me love you less. Pretty heavy duty. This was before Dr. Spock. <laughs> I mean, the, the, you know, the child-rearing Dr. Spock, not the Star Trek Dr. Spock. We wouldn't do this today. Now we just hit him over the head with the Dr. Spock book. Uh, pretty much, at a, and this will come out more later, and then later when she's about 15 in Paris, he lays it on her. My happiness depends upon you alone. That's a heavy responsibility for a 15-year-old. If I'd have told my kids that when they were 15, they just, they'd have told me where to go. They did anyway, even though I didn't try, to, didn't try to coerce them this way. So this is what he's setting up for Martha. Their time in Paris, was really something. Paris was, think about this in terms of scale. Paris was like 70, about 500,000 people. Albemarle County was 10. Philadelphia was like 30. And you can imagine what Paris was like in these days. Anything you wanted. It was kind of a combination of uh, Sodom, Gomorrah, and Las Vegas. Um, anything went, we have, oh, bless her heart, Marie Antoinette, uh, this chubby little fellow here, Louis XVI, uh, they were running a court, and of course it's the center of the Enlightenment. The scientists are there, the people who would come, we'd come to call economists are there, uh, on and on and on. The encyclopedists are there, people trying to gather all the knowledge into some, a few books, other than the one you have over here on the table. And it was quite a place of fashion, too. Um, I always liked the women's hair here. You know, look how they, so how high you could pile your hair. Sometimes they put bird nests in them to decorate them and stuff. Uh, really stylish. And I've always wanted a pair of these hoes. I don't know where I'd wear them, but I really think those are cool. Um, can't find any. I looked at, uh, well, I looked, but I couldn't find any. She went into a convent school. Very elite convent school. Now, here's where we see Jefferson as his, at, at, at his uh, most naive, I guess. But we also, this is one of the places, too, where we begin to see Martha uh, beginning to assert herself, like most teenagers will do. You see, she wasn't really big on that hair. Uh, and so here's what she wrote to a friend. She said, I wish you could have seen me when we arrived. I'm sure you would have laughed for we were obliged to send immediately for the stay maker, the mantua maker, the milliner, and even a shoemaker before I could go out. They had to get her outfit together. I've never had the hairdresser but once, but I soon got rid of him and turned down my hair in spite of it all, they say. I differ it now as much as possible, for I think it is too soon to begin to suffer. So we see Martha beginning to assert herself she may have the matua maker and the stay maker and all those other folks. She just is not going to let her hair be put up like that. So, now this was not humble nuns walking around with folded hands murmuring liturgy. This was also a boarding house for people, down, women, uh, spinsters, divorcees, women down on their luck who had been abandoned by their husbands. Josephine was there, not while well, Martha was there, just before Martha got there, Josephine, the former bride of Napoleon, her husband had abandoned her, and 
She was living there. The abbess was a very politically powerful person, so powerful that the revolution didn't remove her. She got to stay at Tantamont, even though it was converted into, it's now an army, it's still there. It's now an army uh, facility. So this was Pantamont, and it was also the, uh, about 27 young girls uh, from the aristocracy of Europe. So this is what this little girl from, from Hicksville, Albemarle County, is being confronted with. And she's asked to sit at the abbess's table, a high honor. The abbess is a good politician, too. She's got the U.S. minister's daughter here. She's going to play it for all it's worth. And you can imagine what was going on around that table, the gossip. And that comes through in the letters, because she's teasing her father with about how much she's learning about the court intrigue and uh, things being, people being sent to the, to the Bastille, uh, which he ignores. He pretends like she hadn't even said it. So this is where Martha is being reared. Jefferson, again, at his most, sometimes people in word travels, and Virginia was a really small community, you know, and particularly down in Albemarle, there were all 10,000 people. And so people got word of this. She's at a Catholic convent. This is the guy that, you know, uh, I don't know his religious views really, but, or I do, but I'm not going to talk about it. But here's what he wrote back to Virginia. He said, my daughter is indeed in a convent, but in one where there are as many Protestants as Catholics. Really, where not a word is ever said to them on the subject of religion and where they are free as in the profession and practice of their own religion as they would be in their own country. It is a house of education only. I don't think he fooled anybody in Virginia what the convent was about because there were a lot of people there from, <coughs> from America who, you know, who sent back word. But she began asserting herself. Let's go with here. Um, he, he begins writing in the letters about what it's going to be like when we get home. What's a family in the plantation culture like? She's responsible for his happiness now. She expects her to educate her younger sister, and on and on and on. Well, what she tells him is she, t she lets him know that she said, there were a few days ago, there was a man that killed himself because he thought his wife did not love him. They'd been married 10 years. I believe that if every husband in Paris was to do it much, there'd be nothing left in Paris but widows. <laughs> well, she knew very well who it was. It was Lafayette's mistress. And La the mistress, the husband of Lafayette's mistress had killed himself because Lafayette had a mistress. Jefferson knew that, but he just didn't even respond to this. The, but in other correspondence, he lets it be known to other people and when he's doing a little gossip that it was Lafayette's mistress. So she's teasing him a little bit, saying, well, this story about family you're telling me, uh, I'm in, I live in a family of sisters with a powerful woman, a ma matriarchal society. And I'm sitting at the table and now you're, and here's Lafayette. But then she had to lay it on him. There was a ship of Algerines <laughs> captured and they were going to be sold in America as slaves. And she says, good God, are we not enough? I wish with all my soul that the poor Negroes were all freed. It grieves my heart when I think that these, our fellow creatures, should be treated so terribly as they are by our countrymen. So here is this 15-year-old getting exposed to the French Enlightenment and really beginning to think about what the stories that her father's telling her and the world that she's going to go back to, which they do in 1789. Now, we're not... According to Jefferson, he left because he had a, marriage, a daughter of marriageable age and to get his affairs in order. By affairs in order, he meant his finances. Certainly had a marriageable daughter, but also not long before they left, uh, the papal di uh, nu the nuncio, the, the, the papal diplomat in Paris, gave her a book of instruction for Protestants considering the Catholic faith. Hmm. So it may have been that that had a small thing to do with him. Uh, for, for his, also, his, his, some evidence that his secretary, William Short, who was a young man who had gone to Paris, France with Jefferson, uh, Je Short was a young man born in Virginia, but he grew up in France and with a lot of the benefits that that had on someone who might have been otherwise stullified in Virginia. And I, he, looked like he might have been taking a shine to Martha don't have strong evidence of that, but some. So they came home in 1790 
Within about two and a half months, she was married, of course, to her cousin, because it's Virginia. <laughs> it's, it was a rule. Now, so here we have, uh, you know, we have a, a, uh, we have a Tuckahoe Randolph uh, marrying a Randolph from another plantation, from the Dungeness Randolphs. Not the Curls Randolphs, or the Roanoke Randolphs, or the Turkey Island Randolphs. So we got, that's the only way we can keep this stuff straight. They have place names, you know. And pretty soon they ran out of place names, so they had to like the older <laughs> William of Tuckahoe kind of person. Um, so this is an interesting, interesting thing here, I, which I, I just, I have to share this with you. She, uh, now he's in a bind. Because he's been telling her about, if you love me, then you'll become accomplished. And if you're not, you know, if you don't, then I'll, I, it'll, won't, my, my love won't decline. So he gets home, she gets married, he leaves again because he becomes Secretary of State. And this is what he wrote. He said, your new condition of marriage will call for an abundance of little sacrifices, but they will be greatly overpaid by the measure of affection that they will secure to you. The happiness of your life depends now on continuing to please a single person. To this, all other objects must be secondary, even your love to me. Were it possible that that could ever be an obstacle? Hmm. Cherish then for me, my dear child, the affection of your husband, and continue to love me as you have done before. Is this a conundrum? Now you have to please one person. Don't let my love get in the way. Continue to love me like you did before. If you become accomplished, I'll love you more, or else it won't decline, and the happiness of my life depends only on you. Well, sharp. this is a sharp woman by this point. She said, I assure you, my dear papa, my happiness can never be complete without your company. I've made it my study to please Mr. Randolph in everything, and she had the line thing in this letter, and do consider all other objects as secondary to that, except my love for you. So she's putting him on notice that fine, she'll do what she has to do, but uh, don't be confused. And I guess they got along okay, as I said, 12 children over from a period of 26 years, and uh, Secretary of State just quickly on his career. We'll see now, we can see how she works in. She, my happiness can never be complete without your company. And then he talks about her letters of being gleams of light to cheer a dreary scene. And here's where Jefferson begins to use all this strong language about what it life is like in politics. And it just gets m more shrill and more shrill as he goes from 1790 on through the rest of his career, vice president and then presidents. And Martha, of course, is also feeling this sense of separation. I can only, my affections are with you, and everything will be forgotten, all the loneliness when we're once again reconciled at Monticello. So this is the kind of language that flows between them during this, these 20-some these, uh, these years. 1790 to uh, uh, 1809. Uh, this is Jefferson's rationale for running for president. He's going to preserve the republic for his, for his daughters and his grandchildren. And uh, of course, the election of 1800 makes this year's election look like a Sunday school picnic. It's so boring this year compared to 18. The reason I live in the 18th century is in my head is because it's much more interesting. At least the governors of M M Virginia and Philadelphia and Pennsylvania threatened to bring out the militia if Jefferson wasn't elected. I mean, they stood by what they what they believed in. We're gonna we're gonna and he Jefferson cautioned not to do that yet. And it and it took 36 ballots in the House of Representatives to elect him. Uh, but this was his rationale for doing that. 1801 to 1809, a lot happens during that period. A rich correspondence. No, she was never first lady. Uh, she was there only on two occasions. In fact, delivered the first child ever born in the president's house, James Madison Randolph. So 1801 to 1809. But these are the kind of language that Jefferson used to describe in the letters, toils, inquietudes, envy, malice. Nauseating, intolerable, <laughs> agitations, raucous pa rancorous passions, and so forth and so on. This is how he's describing his life. But there's another life that they're waiting for. This isn't the way it's always going to be. They're going to have another life. It's going to be here on the mountaintop. 
This is a place that the two of them describe as the most healthy place in Virginia and maybe the world. It's a place where you can look out on the, the landscape and get all kinds of aesthetic appreciation. When the, when, when the flowers are blooming, it's the effervescence just inspires them, the heights of rhetoric. Was it always that way? No, it was a pretty confusing place. Uh, right around the house, of course, you've got chicken yards and you've got all kinds of uh, activities, a blacksmith shop and other kinds of activities going on. It wasn't this kind of bucolic terra gone with the wind place. Working plantations were pretty crude and rude sometimes. But if I'm trying to long for something in the future, I want to make it as attractive as possible. Otherwise, why wait for it? So this is how they describe, no, Jefferson did, her father, no jarring jealousies. Well, that didn't turn out to be so well. No dangerous biases and so forth. Domestic occupation, domestic love. This was the world that they created. 1809, he leaves, he, of course, we, that was his last term as president. Uh, they prepare, and Martha has been living at the foot of Monticello Mountain with her husband and her children. Every time her father would come home, she would go to the top of the mountain to get the plantation ready and serve as hostess. And the place was like a hotel, as you might imagine. 1809, he's coming home. She leaves her husband at the bottom of the mountain and moves to the top of the mountain with her children. That's how much she was intent upon being with her father. I think this says it, and I don't even want to read it because I think it's uh, so poignant that you may want to read it yourselves. I think one of the... Uh, any other duty, I would scruple no sacrifice. I mean, that is like a pledge that, you know, we don't hear too often. Um, and he, she equates that with happiness. And after all, that is the pursuit, is happiness. And for her, she's saying, my happiness is to make, to comfort your own age. Uh, she said in another letter, to provide a harbor from the cares and storms of life which indicates she's been reading Cicero, at least, because that's where that comes from. Um, and here at the end, we said no pen. So at this point, letters have kept them attached while they've been separated, painful separations, and now it is so intense, she can't even write it down any longer. And he is saying the same kind of thing. I just, I cannot write about this anymore. I just have to get home. I have to be there. So it was this image of being in a place that is far superior to any other place, being where there's no jarring jealousies and no, no salamanders, if you will, as it was in Washington City. And that place is what balanced that political life that he found so hard and uh, so emotionally difficult. So emotionally difficult. So it all ended up with, uh, and this is the, Jefferson's story, this is a story they fabricated, actually, uh, and as that's described at length in the book. Beginning in 1809, they start writing this story about how they're impoverished, not, or, or heavily in debt. Um, Martha's eldest son, when he goes to ask for the hand of his future bride, tells her father, who happens to be president of the Bank of the United States in Richmond, tells her father, he says, you know, my, my father, meaning his father, Thomas Mann Randolph Jr., my father's estate will soon be non-existent and my grandfather's is rapidly deteriorating. This doesn't seem like much of a recommendation when you ask for <laughs> asking for the hand of the daughter of the president of the bank, but that's the story they had been to begin telling in 1809. They embellished it, Jefferson did, and then Martha did, and their grandchild did, and it became entombed in the first full biography of Jefferson, and it's 1856. Oh the Jefferson family story. Now, why would they tell that story, do you think? Why is it good to be impoverished? Well, the background of that, the backstory, again, which it goes into more detail in the book, was a concept called civic virtue. Today we call it public service, but then the highest thing you could do in a Republican form of government, not, not factional, a Republican type of government, was to give yourself to the good of the citizens. So the more you gave, and you paid your own way. Jefferson had the munificent salary of 25,000 for the president's house, for which he had to fund the operation of the president's house. The dinners, 
the servants, the carriage, the horses, the fodder, cleaning out the stables, was, came out of that $25,000. But the poorer you were at the end, it was the, more you had, the more you had given, the higher you were, the higher status. So, and in an essay he wrote for himself near the end of his life, he really says that. That's an essay that really hasn't been published much, but he really talks about 60 years of, exam of service that probably won't be equaled ever. He actually says that, and he's probably right. But so this is a high honor to have exhibited that much civic virtue. Martha lost her home, that place they dreamed about, that ideal place on the top of the mountain, Monticello, and she just longed if I could ever have a home again. It doesn't have to be in a big home, just one that's respectable, a respectable home. Martha, uh, of course, is ripped out of her home. The place was sold, and she spends the last 10 years of her life, 1826 to 1836, moving up and down the Atlantic coast. Her son lives at the foot of the mountain. Her daughter lives in Boston. She has a daughter that, uh, son-in-law and daughter that end up in Washington City, and she kind of floats between those and has a rich correspondence with her daughters, uh, with, uh, some near relative, with some relatives and some in-laws. But this is, uh, this is kind of her feeling. I, I just want to let Martha have the last word here, really. Uh, it was, it's her story, primarily, and uh, it's a story about her and her father. This is Martha. And Martha will have the closing word here. I never had and never shall have the folly to be ashamed of an honorable poverty. It is the fruits and the price we have paid for a long and useful life devoted to the service of his country. But I never regretted the sacrifice he made. His country had a right to his services. And if a few must suffer for the advantage of the many, it is a melancholy necessity that I see no help for it. So that's Martha's kind of coda to her life. Thank you very much.